Rejection can be the number one area of pain, concern, and obsession for writers. After working as an editor for more than 15 years, I still hear secondhand stories about writers who've been wounded by my feedback many years after the fact. Just about every single time, while I often remember the writer in question, I've completely forgotten what I said or even what the project was about. If you talk to other editors and agents, you'll find this is pretty common. So many projects cross our desks, and sending rejections is a near daily occurrence. It's next to impossible to keep mental track of what becomes only one detail of the business. I tell you this story to help you understand why you shouldn't take rejection personally. As we've discussed throughout this course, when you seek publication, you have to switch mindsets. You have to see your writing as a product. You're entering into a business transaction. I too have had my share of rejection. It gets easier the more you experience it. And especially when you work on the inside of a publishing house or literary agency, and you see how many decisions get made day to day, you realize there's nothing about it that any author ought to take personally or even seriously. Of course, that's very easy to say. You can acknowledge this aspect of the business as quite rational or logical, but it's quite another thing to overcome the emotional sting when you've spent years of your life on a project that someone spends a few minutes deciding isn't worth further consideration. When some writers begin receiving rejections, they start to carry around what I call the rejection burden, which tends to color all of their interactions with agents and editors and even color their future work. You should periodically stop to consider if you've allowed the wound of rejection to transform you or your work into something you never intended. Here's a parable that I like to share with writers who might be carrying a rejection burden. Two monks come to a muddy river crossing. There they see a young woman dressed in a very fine kimono, obviously not knowing how to cross the river without ruining her clothes. The older monk picks her up and carries her across the muddy river, placing her onto dry ground. The woman does not thank him, but goes on her way. Hours later, the monks find themselves at a lodging temple. And here the younger monk can no longer restrain himself, and his complaints gush forth. I cannot believe that woman. You kindly carried her on your very own back, and she did not offer thanks. The older monk calmly observes, I put the woman down some time ago. Why are you still carrying her? This isn't to make light of rejection, but to emphasize the importance of being able to let go of it or finding a way to react in a constructive manner. Put another way, the rejection itself isn't as important as what you decide to do next. Here's my suggested method of dealing with it. First, acknowledge the hurt that you probably feel. Wallow for a set amount of time, whether that's five minutes or five days. When I was a college student, my creative writing professor told us that she would take to bed for a few hours. But when that time runs out, you have to promise yourself that you'll get back to work. Next, avoid parsing vague or form rejection letters. We'll talk more about this later, but it's mostly a waste of your time and energy. If you get useful feedback, consider it a gift and use it to improve your work. If you violently disagree with any criticism you receive, that might be the rarest gift of all. Put your work aside for a few weeks or months, then revisit it. You might find the criticism right on the money. It's imperative you not lose total confidence after a rejection, no matter how long the rejection process lasts. Remember that whatever uncertainty plagues you is natural and part of the process. Sometimes the best way to deal with it is to continue to read and write what you love. Every writer finds coping mechanisms or rituals that work, and the sooner you find your own, the better. Some writers always keep their work out on submission, meaning that if one rejection comes back, the work is always under consideration elsewhere. This is smart because it's dangerous to tie all of your hopes to one specific editor, publisher, or agent. Having a lot of irons in the fire can be productive. You always have the possibility of a positive response ahead. 
As you become more experienced at sending work out and receiving responses, you'll begin to see that your hit rate or the number of relative successes you have will be fairly consistent and also a fairly low percentage of all submissions. The sooner you can learn this about the publishing business, the less rejection will score a lasting hit to your confidence. I also encourage writers that once they finish a manuscript, the first thing they should immediately do is start work on another project. This helps create distance and perspective from the project you just finished, which will inevitably need to be revisited with a more critical eye later. For genre writers, this process can make a lot of sense if you're working on a series. You can get to work right away on book two as you're trying to sell book one. While your family and friends should be there to offer moral support during the tough times, be careful when listening to their advice when it comes to next steps on your work. Your family and friends love you and see you in your work. They want you to be happy and to succeed. An editor doesn't know you and is more objective, especially when it comes to marketability. Publishing professionals have distance. You and your closest friends and family may not. I mention this because at some point, as every writer does, you'll try to, to determine your next steps based on the rejections you're receiving. Reasons for rejection are incredibly subjective and can boil down to indefinable issues of taste. But let's go over what types of feedback writers most often get. The most basic and avoidable reason for rejection is that you submitted your work to someone who is ultimately inappropriate for your work. This happens if you didn't properly research agents and editors or adopted a mass submission approach. Despite all the resources available to writers, inappropriate submissions still remain the number one reason for rejection along with submission materials that aren't properly prepared or that failed to follow the agent or publisher's guidelines. Another common reason is that something similar was recently published, or you're trying to publish in a category that's saturated. This particularly happens with nonfiction work, but can also happen in fiction when there are noticeable trends that everyone's copying. Similarly, and this is hard to pinpoint from a form rejection, but your timing may just be bad. Maybe the editor who would have been receptive to your project has left, or the publisher has cut back on their list, or the market's changed in some way. One of the toughest types of rejections to accept is when the note is very complimentary. The editor or agent may say they really enjoyed or even loved your work, but the market for it's too small. So what can you do about this? Well, the logical next step would be to approach a smaller publisher because they have a lower threshold of sales to meet. But if the market is too small for even the small press, then you should probably self-publish. If that's not what you want, then you have to think through whether it's possible to make your book appear more marketable. This isn't particularly easy. And many talented writers fail to achieve commercial success because they simply don't think like marketers and they have mediocre marketing skills. Conversely, some mediocre writers are quite successful because they know how to position their work so that it entices publishers. Here are some other phrases you might read in a rejection letter. Doesn't fit our needs at this time. This is classic all-purpose rejection language. It could mean literally anything, so don't try to interpret it. It's a stock phrase that gets used again and again by everyone in the publishing industry. Doesn't have sufficient market appeal means exactly what it says. Perhaps the market for your work is too small, as we just discussed, or maybe your work lacks punch. It's not different enough, unique enough, or special enough for people to take notice. Just couldn't get excited about it. If someone makes this comment about your fiction, it usually reflects a weak story or protagonist or something without a compelling conflict. Your story hasn't emotionally engaged the editor or agent. The writing doesn't stand out. This probably means your writing lacks style, sophistication, or voice. It could also mean your story is boring, unoriginal, 
or uninspired. Not fresh enough. For fiction writers, perhaps your plot line is too cliche. Your characters are too common, or your story is not unique enough for publication. The story is too quiet. This response is common for literary writers who may have a very gently paced book. The characters may be beautifully expressed, but don't do anything of interest. The story probably has too much subtlety and too little action to keep readers turning the pages. You don't have a sufficient platform is a reason given most often to nonfiction writers who lack adequate credentials, authority, or visibility to the target market. We discussed this issue at length in an earlier lecture. All of these phrases I've just explained might be included in a form rejection. You can usually tell form rejections from the personal ones. A form rejection may not be signed by a specific person, it might not be specifically addressed to you, or it might not say anything specific about your work. It could very well be a photocopied letter that gets sent to hundreds or thousands of writers. Sometimes it clearly states that it's a form rejection. These stock phrases might also get included in a personalized rejection, which generally hold more weight or deserve more attention than the form rejection. A personalized rejection obviously takes more time and thoughtfulness than the form letter. An agent or editor would only take additional time to write one if they see something in your work that impresses them or might merit their consideration in the future. They might also venture to give you specific insight or guidance on how to improve your work. You can consider such communication a sign that you're getting closer to publication. Agents or editors can tell you're on the verge of producing something great or might even be accepted by someone else. Sometimes a personalized rejection comes with an invitation to submit your next work or resubmit your work if you make changes to it. It can be difficult to decide what to do next should you stop the submissions process to revise. This is something you need to take seriously, but never undertake revision to your work unless you do believe the suggestions will improve it. If the feedback opens your eyes to how your work could genuinely reach the next level, you should hit the pause button, revise, and resubmit. Accepting feedback and incorporating it into your work will win major points with an agent or editor. This demonstrates serious intent and professionalism. However, if you have doubts about the feedback, keep submitting. See if you receive any more personalized rejections. If a pattern emerges in the feedback, that's a strong case for revision. Whatever happens, there's only one proper response to a personalized rejection. And that's a thank you. Don't try to open up a conversation about the work unless explicitly invited and never ever argue with the rejection. You don't want to make the agent or editor sorry that they tried to help you. Which brings us to a growing phenomenon in the publishing world, which is often surprising to those in other professions. The new rejection is often silence meaning you'll never receive any response or acknowledgement that your work was even received. So why is this considered acceptable? Part of it has to do with the sheer volume of submissions that agents and publishers receive. But another reason has to do with some professionals who have grown tired of non-professional responses to their rejection letters. It consumes too much time they could more profitably spend on existing clients or projects. They don't like saying no and then having to justify their decision or saying no multiple times when a writer continues to submit the same work after being rejected once. I once had a writer contact me and ask how they could respond to an agent who had rejected his work because there was too much passive voice. The writer was frustrated because the agent's diagnosis was in fact wrong. And the agent's misunderstanding of passive voice was clearly leading to unfair rejections. This is a classic example of an agent who is likely reaching for the most ready reason available to them to reject a work. It may be disheartening to learn that a publishing professional doesn't understand grammar, uses poor grammar herself, or would even reject something on the basis of grammar alone. But ultimately, it doesn't matter. 
sometimes the reasons you're given are a poor attempt to provide a rational explanation for something that isn't at all rational. The reality is that impressions get formed in seconds, and they're often gut instincts. A reason or explanation is applied only after the fact. I also meet many writers who emphasize that they just need an agent or publisher to offer serious consideration. You just know your book deserves publication. The only problem is you can't get anyone in the industry to pay attention to you. If only someone would pay attention, you'd have it made, right? Unfortunately, just about every writer thinks exactly the same thing. Writers have an amazing ability to consider themselves the one exception. But this kind of exceptionalist thinking doesn't get you any closer to publication. Getting past the rejection phase and finding a way to build a relationship with a potential agent or publisher often means understanding what motivates those agents or publishers in the first place. Arguing over a rejection or pleading for attention won't accomplish that. If you find an opportunity to talk to an agent at a conference, instead of thinking about all the things you want from them or devising clever ways to influence them, be curious instead. Ask questions like, what's the most challenging part of your job? Or what do you look for in a partnership with an author? Or what do you wish every author knew before they entered into a partnership with you. In response, you'll gain insight that could be useful for the next time you submit your work. When you're not in a position of strategic power, when you want something from someone, but you have nothing proven to offer in return, it benefits you to learn, listen, and find out how you can be a desirable partner. Most agents and editors do not enjoy being the focus of writers' hopes. If you, as a writer, see yourself as an equal to the people you'd like to work with, you'll be better able to treat communications in a way that doesn't emphasize your need to have something. That, in turn, removes the emotional tension and power struggle that can enter into your communication. An editor or agent will be more honest and forthright with you if they see you as a professional and if they can expect an interaction to be productive rather than an energy drain. More progress than you might think depends on the willingness of agents and editors to help you and advise you, even when they can't represent you or publish you. So bottom line, be gracious during the rejection process. If you find yourself demonizing people in the publishing industry, taking rejections very personally, feeling as if you're owed something, or complaining whenever you get together with other writers, it's time to hit the refresh button. Return to what made you feel joy and excitement about writing in the first place. Perhaps you've been focusing too much on getting published and you've forgotten to cherish the other aspects. So let's say you've gone through the submissions process and haven't been able to gain any traction. No agent or publisher has expressed serious interest and you have very little to go on as far as how to make the work more marketable. It would be helpful to know at this point how close you are to getting your book traditionally published. Wouldn't it be nice if someone could say, if you just keep at it for three more years, you're certain to make it. Even if it's not possible for me to read your work, I can usually say something close to the mark about what your next steps should be. I often see when writers are wasting their time. No matter where you're at on your own publishing path, it's helpful to periodically take stock of where you're headed and revise as necessary. Let's start by summarizing three common time-wasting behaviors that lead to fast rejection. First, if you've been submitting manuscripts that aren't your best work, you're doing yourself a disservice. You have to give each manuscript everything you've got with nothing held back. Too many writers save their best effort for some future work as if they were going to run out of good material. You can't operate like that. Every single piece of greatness must go into your current project. Be confident that your well is going to be refilled. Make your book better than you ever thought possible. That's what it needs to compete. It can't just be good. Good gets rejected. Your work has to be the best. 
How do you know when it's ready? When it's your best? If you think the story has a problem, it does. And any story with a problem is not ready. Second, if you're trying to secure a book deal from a major New York publisher for your very niche or regional work, you're pursuing the wrong path to publication. You have to be honest with yourself about the commercial potential for your work. And not every book deserves distribution to every bookstore in the country. Finally, some writers focus on publishing far too early when they should be focused on writing. This mainly applies to fiction writers, since many nonfiction writers do in fact pitch their book before writing it. If you're a novelist consumed with finding an agent before you've even finished your manuscript, you've got things backwards. While it's helpful for writers to be active in the publishing community by attending conferences or developing relationships with established authors, I see too many writers developing anxiety about the publishing process before they've even demonstrated to themselves that they can commit to writing and revising thousands and thousands of words, before they put in the amount of work that creates a publication-ready manuscript. Whenever I sit down for a consultation with a writer, I ask three questions early on. How long have you been working on this manuscript? And who has seen it? Is this the first manuscript you've ever completed? And how long have you been actively writing? These questions often strongly indicate how close you are to a traditional deal. Here are a few generalizations I can make. Many first manuscript attempts are not publishable, even after revision, yet they're necessary and vital for a writer's growth. A writer who's just finished her first manuscript probably doesn't realize this and will likely take the rejection process very hard, and some writers can't move past this rejection. A writer who's been working on the same manuscript for years and years and has written nothing else might be tragically stuck. There isn't usually much valuable learning going on when someone tinkers with the same pages over a decade. Writers who've been actively writing for many years have produced multiple full-length manuscripts, have one or two trusted critique partners or mentors, and have attended a couple major writing conferences are often well positioned for publication. They probably know their strengths and weaknesses and have a structured revision process. Such writers often require only luck. And there's that old saying about luck. It's when preparedness meets opportunity. Writers who have extensive experience in one medium then attempt to tackle another, like when journalists tackle a novel, may overestimate their abilities to produce a publishable manuscript on the first try. That doesn't mean their effort won't be good, but it might not be good enough. Fortunately, any writer with professional experience will probably approach the process with more of a business mindset, as well as a good network of contacts to help them understand the next steps. Notice, I have not mentioned talent. I have not mentioned creative writing classes or degrees. I have not mentioned who you know. These factors are usually less relevant in determining how close you are to a traditional publishing contract. The two factors that are typically most relevant are first, how much time you've put into writing. I agree with Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hour rule expressed in his book Outliers. The key to success in any field is to a large extent a matter of practicing a specific task for a total of around 10,000 hours. The second factor is whether you're reading enough to understand where you lie on the spectrum of quality. And we'll talk more about this in the next lecture. Indicators will eventually surface if your work has sufficient quality but isn't suited for commercial publication. You'll hear things like, your work is too quirky or eccentric. It has narrow appeal. It's experimental. It doesn't fit the model. Or possibly, it's too intellectual, too demanding. These are signs that you may need to consider self-publishing or wait for the publishing winds to change. Pay attention when people enthusiastically respond to something that you didn't expect. I see this happen all the time. A writer's working on a manuscript that no one seems interested in, 
that has fabulous success on some side project. Or perhaps you really want to push your memoir, but it's a humorous tip series on your blog that everyone loves. Sometimes it's better to pursue what's working and what people express interest in, especially if you take enjoyment in it. Use it as a stepping stone to other things if necessary. Which brings me to the overall theory of how you should, at various stages of your career, revisit and revise your publication strategy. No matter how the publishing world changes, consider these three timeless factors as you make decisions about your next steps forward. First, what makes you happy? This is the reason you got into writing in the first place. Even if you put this on the back burner in order to advance other aspects of your writing and publishing career, don't leave this out of the equation for very long. Otherwise, your efforts can come off as mechanistic or uninspired, and you'll eventually burn out. Two, what earns you money? Not everyone cares about earning money from writing, and I believe that anyone in it for the coin should find some other field. But as you gain experience, the choices you make in this regard become more important. The more professional you become, the more you have to pay attention to what brings the most return on your investment of time and energy. As you succeed, you don't have time to pursue every opportunity. You have to stop doing some things. For example, a novelist who prefers to dabble in several genres may need to commit to one genre or a particular series where they have the most demonstrable fan base, rather than switching off as the mood suits her. A nonfiction writer who enjoys writing personal essays, which are in notorious oversupply, may have to set that work aside to focus on articles or books that have a higher market value. Three, what reaches readers or grows your audience? Growing readership is just as valuable as earning money. Sometimes you'll want to make trade-offs that involve earning less money in order to grow readership because it invests in your future. For example, some industry conferences or events don't pay their speakers, but they put you in front of some of the most important insiders or influencers in your community. Or more relevant to fiction writers, you may be asked to contribute some of your work to a bundle or anthology for which you'll be compensated very little or not at all. But if the other contributors have very high stature and established readerships, then you have good reason to believe your work will be exposed to thousands of readers who would have never heard of you before. It's rare that every piece of writing you do or every opportunity presented can involve all three elements at once. Commonly, you can get two of the three. Sometimes you'll pursue certain projects with only one of these factors in play. You get to decide based on your priorities at any given point in time. Earlier, I suggested that it might be nice if someone could tell you whether you're wasting your time trying to get traditionally published. Here's a little piece of hope. If your immediate thought was, I couldn't stop writing, even if someone told me to give up, then you're much closer to publication than someone who's easily discouraged. The battle is far more psychological than you might think and that's what we'll discuss next.